Why don't I start with, um, start with Karen. I had the opportunity to actually share some thoughts with Karen um, when we were going through the posters. Um, and and there, are, there are some great challenges, but also good opportunities ahead. So Karen, if we can start with you, maybe, um, what do you see as the current strategic and policy level gaps um, with your work? Kia ora koutou, um, I'm one of the Chief Executive of the Mental Health Wellbeing Commission and look, um, great opportunity to be here today and just echo the thank you for all the work that you all do. Um, I'm just going to pick up a few key points because I'm sure the other panel members will also have um, thoughts to share. So just uh, in terms of some of those key sort of strategic policy gaps, the areas that um, we see in the Commission is um, I suppose having that really clear roadmap um, of one of the most important things that we can action now, next month, six months time, a year's time, two years time, because there is so much to do, it can seem really overwhelming. So how do we have some clarity on the smaller number of things that we think could be what I would describe as the game changers, the things that will really make the biggest impact. So that's the first thing. Um, the second is much stronger lived experience leadership across the country. And when I engage with other countries, I hear about some of the peak bodies and the work that they're doing to really promote lived experience and leadership at that national level. And I see that as a really key enabler for, for growing the peace support workforce and for co-design of services. So I think that's something that we could all be thinking much more about. And look, the, the third thing is about our collective leadership. I'm a firm believer that we're all in this together. We're really passionate about what we're here for. Um, there's things that we can do every day to make a difference and how do we be much more collaborative, be much more joined up, leverage off each other's strengths and opportunities and really um, just be so much more joined up. But that's up for me. Anyone else would like to share? Chuck on. Kia ora tato. Uh, thank you for having us here, and now maybe to Kelly and the team for putting it on, it on today. Uh, I guess I would just uh, echo some of the things that Karen said, or us to say that we turn up at work every day to make this difference. We have a small team, we're working really hard. Uh, mental health and addiction workforce is a priority, uh, and again, as Karen said, uh, we're putting one foot in front of the other, uh, and it's a very broad space and we are looking uh, at improving everything from the very specialist psychiatry services and all the way to lived experience is also a very important goal and everything in between. So we are making um, uh, really good progress but there's a whole lot more to do. Uh, kia ora koutou, I'm Anna McNaughton Program Manager at Health Community Engagement at the Ministry. Um, I think we have some policies uh, if we think about Kia Manu and Nui, the cross-government focus, and then obviously the Oranga Hininara System Service Framework, which clearly identified the need for more Asian services, more culturally appropriate services. I think the challenge we have is, is our ability to be able to um, put them in place. These do take time, and I think there have been some changes already uh, that are looking at trying to improve it. We're still a long way away, but I think we are getting better at how we make sure that um, Asian voice is included in that and then there is outcomes for that and I'm really keen to talk a little bit more about how we can continue to make sure on work that's coming up that there is a strong place and access for that Asian voice in those policies so that the policies are able to be then implemented to have action. Kia ora. Very quickly before I call Ian McKenzie. I just want to sort of try and fill in the gaps a little bit there around the sort of structural the vehicle, if you like, for policy and, and strategy delivery. And um, I'm um, well prepared to say that it's been quite a bumpy ride of health reform over these last uh, few years. Um, still going on. However, the, the positives, in my view, are that um, one organisation to um, to fund and deliver the health services in this country rather than 28 uh, is a very good idea. All those things that people were identifying as problems um, aren't fixed yet, but there's a much greater chance, and I'm talking about data, I'm talking about consistency of policy, talking about models of care and um, clinical pathways, all of them are much um, 
much easier to deliver if that's kind of agreed once at the high level and then allowed locally and regionally to, to form local uh, solutions and local ways of doing it. And that's what I'm talking about Asian communities, where you are and the ability to work under an umbrella or a framework to develop services that work for people. So um, I'm positive about that and positive even with the, um, the, the latest raft of, of changes. This is about regionalization now and you know the, the jargon is powering up the regions. But what that means is that there's a much greater opportunity for that uh, localization and local development of, of services. People know each other as they're working within a, a sort of a catchment. Uh, nationally things will have to go through the kind of middle and they sometimes get tangled up in a, in a bureaucratic um, Swamp, um, they could call it, or well, someone does anyway. Now, <laughs> friend Trump. Um, and <laughs> why did I go there? <laughs> but I guess saying that the regional um, approaches to um, mental health and addictions, I think, will work better um, for our Asian communities. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I actually like to. Um give the opportunity to the floor because I wanted to make a special mention to some of uh, you sitting in the audience today who are actually not from Auckland. You travelled either last night or very, very early this morning, including our minister, uh, to be here to listen. Um, but I want you to be able to have that opportunity to raise and ask questions, particularly, for example, if you wanted to understand a little bit more about powering up the regions or that if you have feedback or, or if you have a good local success story that you can share. And so our officials and our minister and parliamentarians in this room can actually understand and see how it actually worked being localized and being regionalized. So I give it, there we go. Shan, I actually know her, she's from Toronto. My question is how we can have a database and a, a network or some engager, we can bring all the things, all the amazing things we do together in the unity. What are the policy we can put in place? For example, I'm an ECE teacher. I actually so proud of our ECE curriculum. We talk about the uh, uh, Fadiki and the Kitty of Knowledge. Each of the uh, individual bring Kitty of Knowledge and we join together with uh, Fadiki together. But how we can put that curriculum transitioning smoothly to primary, to intermediate, to high school, to university, so we can link together to make the Fadiki bigger, connected, for everyone to stand up. That's my question. That's a very broad question. Great, thank you. Yeah, I'm only going to answer that one percent of that, but I'll have to go. Um, I, I think, well, I think it's important to point out, because you said about Tauranga, that I, I work in a national uh, role. So, um, so again, the, the benefits of a, um, a national organisation, national collaborative organisations working with the um, Ministry of Health is around information. And, and I just love the um, keynote um, speech this morning and the challenges in there. However, we are going to be able to collect data. If you think of the um, the minister's priorities and then think of the targets, mm -hmm. they will be able to be broken down by, um, by ethnicity, they will be able to be broken down by locality. In fact, that is going to give us a huge amount of information that's going to support future investments. So I think that's the, the opportunity that we have is to have a much greater um, level of consistency in our data. And that's not just the target data, it will be activity data. Um, in terms of the comment that you made about Fadi here, um, I challenge you folk back. This is about collaboration mm -hmm. and this is about sharing of information. The social investment approach actually does bring government departments together, but none of that accounts for, I think, what was being discussed there about people working together, sharing information, coming up with common agreement about what an outcome is or what a, what a challenge is, and I think that that's actually important for the community to be working out. And from a, my background in improvement, um, and health is a people business. It's all about the relationships, and it's all about um, having the time to actually come together in forums like this, but also to share in other forums. So, yeah, hats off to you, Kelly, because it's well known that having those um, interpersonal connections will actually improve the system. 
So what happens when people get really busy, and the system is busy, we're all busy, is that we know that the reaching out and the connections and some of the communication relationships, those are things that we might trade off to actually get the job done. So it's really important that we do hold the space to keep those connections, keep those relationships, so that we can hear the wonderful stories that have just been shared and um, the other wonderful stories of innovation um, and creativity that's happening across the system. So I just say hold that space for um, connecting with each other. Uh, just a very super quick uh, response to that from probably more of a community engagement perspective. There are already some networks, so things like nav the Navigate meetings, uh, some of the connections through platform. I really encourage about how we continue some of those networks that are already community driven rather than getting us in the ministry to do that. It's really, we, we want to connect in with those groups um, so that I'd be really looking at suggesting you look at what are those groups. Um, and connecting them with obviously Asian Family Services and their networks, we, we connect very much with that. So building on the existing community rather than creating new ones would be one of my suggestions. Thank you. And I, I've got a question here very quickly. It's actually piggybacking on Karen's comment a bit earlier. You said um, uh, what is missing and sometimes very challenging is that clear roadmap. You know, uh, what we're doing now in one month and three months and, and ongoing. Um, and I, I'm sure everyone in this room acknowledges um, that mental health, whether race or ethnicity or gender or age, uh, is a continuously evolving project. Um, so I would like if anyone um, is happy to share a little bit more about your recent roadmap. Like, what are we expecting? Some changes or extra funding or extra resources in certain areas in your work or in your space um, that you think will be a valuable insight for, for our audience here today. I missed the Minister's opening remarks this morning, but uh, obviously we are looking uh, for the publishing uh, in a few months of the uh, mental health uh, and addiction component of the health workforce plan, which will have some clear steps uh, towards what we're wanting to achieve in that area. Um, also, uh, Ian's talked about the health targets as well, which gives some very clear uh, roadmap about and targets for what we're trying to achieve in mental health addiction. I could also speak to the, um, the call it the system and services framework or, or system design uh, work. Um, we're really committed to, um, it's, it's contained in the policy document here, Manawanui, to um, to develop a, a current state map, which was nearly completed, which really records investment across the nation. And it's pretty variable, you'd have to say, mm -hmm. across DHB land, um, and people invested in different things at different times and in different ways. Um, and once that's done, um, a network is not a network, a network which is actually tapping into networks like this to design what a system should function like, and then move our, our funding um, Eventually, there's not a lot of funding around at the moment, but we remain ever optimistic, don't we? <laughs> that when that happens, we should be able to both uh, rebalance the, um, the, the inequities, um, support priority groups, and, um, and actually allow local communities again to develop solutions that work for them. So watch out for the system and services uh, framework work under the uh, system design uh, heading, addictions is coming. Child and youth has already started, and high and complex needs is coming as well. So there's a place for you in there. Uh, there are also three key pieces of work uh, that the ministry are leading. One is obviously uh, the work that was started two, three years ago on the Republic in place of the Mental Health Act. I uh, really want to acknowledge um, all of the units that provided input into that. We've worked closely with um, Asian Family Services and some of uh, the districts at the time to make sure that there was an opportunity for uh, Asian lived experience and Asian voice in that space. So there is work continuing on that with the Minister. I really want to acknowledge the, the um, engagement from the Minister and that work since coming into our office. So that is work that will be coming in at some point will uh, end up at Select Committee. So we will be making sure that through our networks uh, and newsletters that we get that out to you and link you to the information of how to access select committee that is run by a separate part of government but we will be making sure that that is coming. The other two pieces of work that will be coming um, later this year is um, ongoing work, uh, the next uh, review of the gambling heart with preventing and minimising 
gambling harm strategy, and we know that Asian our community are significantly more impacted by gambling harm than other areas. So again, I met with uh, Kelly and Ivan in the last uh, week or so to be talking about uh, when that is launched, how we make sure Asian voices can be heard, amplified, including uh, Asian lived experience on that as well. Uh, and the third piece, uh, which is a continuing issue that we continue to look at, is around suicide prevention. So we almost completed the first five years of the action plan to the uh, strategy, and later in the year we'll also be uh, reaching out for feedback on that as well. So really want to make sure that we can be getting your input, your feedback, both what's working and what's not working so that we can work with the Minister to make sure that what we're looking at in the future in the way of especially cross-government, that we're looking at, we're putting the right um, focus on the right area and then being able to work with our partners in, in how things are to make sure and in the wider cross government to make sure that we're doing actions that will actually really save lives but also support um, close venture as well. So there are some real opportunities. Uh, it will come out through Asian Family Services. It will come out through some of our other uh, news videos. Really happy for you to reach out to me be put on those. We are very clear about wanting to hear and being serious about the feedback that we get. Um, from, from you and, and from our actual North experience community. Can you, Karen? I'll just talk briefly about a report we released a few months ago. It's called Kuiti Mata Te Hairanga, or The Journey Has Begun. And it was quite a comprehensive deep dive into access to the Department of Action Services, right across from um, telehealth services, primary community, specialist services. Um, including uh, people accessing um, support through um, emergency departments, ambulance and police. So it was a really poor rush up the system. So it was positive in that we're seeing a big increase through the Access and Choice program, so that's a positive. But we've seen some really constrained access to special services, which very much resonates from uh, what we hear um, consistently. And there's a big qualitative piece, it's actually a separate report there as well. The Commission does have the power to make recommendations, um, so we have actually made recommendations on the back of that report. And I just thought, um, because of the conversations, you might be interested about, about those. Um, so there's four that are to Health New Zealand, but it were my colleagues um, here, and we did actually work up these recommendations in a, in a collaborative way, recognising our different roles. Um, so the first is about a workforce plan, so we're expecting that relatively soon, so looking forward to that. Um, uh, developing a, an action plan to meet the needs for Māori using services, and that's because of uh, the inequities that sit um, for Māori and the high needs. Um, having some guidance around acute options for rangatahi and young people. So we um, have, are seeing that increased rates of distress for our young people are really concerning um, and really wanting to see more um, options that are community-based for people, young people, when they're experiencing a crisis. We'd be pleased to know we've also asked for um, a data plan for mental health and addiction data. Um, we know that that's absolutely fundamental to actually knowing how the system performing. Is it doing what it's intended to do? Is it making a difference? Are population outcomes improving? Are the services having a positive impact? So we really need good data. And that um, links to the, the last one, which is around prevalence data. So knowing what is the level of need in the community. And so, so those are things that are on our immediate horizon for that particular piece of work. There's a lot of other things we're doing as well, but I just thought I'd highlight those. Thank you. Now, I have a few more spare minutes left. Question. We'll start with, we'll start with Jason and then, and then we'll... No, yeah, so Jason up here. Maybe an introduction of who you are. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'll just tell you guys a little bit about myself. I'm Jason, um, my, my job is I'm a psychiatrist. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, we, 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 we sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, we get a lot. Of, yeah, we get a lot of crap for being for being um, not for there not being more of us, I suppose. Uh, but I'm from Christchurch. I'm here with my buddy Alan who's at that table. Um, so we're from Christchurch, um, and um, we're here representing our our charitable trust that we started a couple of years back. Um, I suppose I want to share just a short, really short but encouraging story with you guys. 
um, but also I've got some questions and some challenges as well for us. Uh, yeah, yeah, very short, very short. Um, uh, I don't like long speeches. So a couple of years back, we started our trust uh, with the heart of really helping Asian people learn more about mental health problems, because we know that we don't like to talk about it, especially older generation. It's very much, shh, you know, hush, hush, don't talk about it, hide it, you know, and sweep it under the, sweep it under the carpet sort of thing. So we wanted to just raise awareness and um, help people talk about it. Um, when we first started, we kind of just went around different community groups and we invited people to come and, and have an information night. And we were pleasantly surprised because more than 100 Chinese people turned up um, to the information night to kind of learn more about what we're offering. Um, then we partnered with another community group to do a uh, mental health coaching course. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've had over 100 people go through the course. Um, so these are, these are people who are not mental health professionals. You know, we know that there's not enough people to be mental health professionals. We can't even fill the spaces that we're funded. You know, there's vacancies everywhere. So there's not enough people. So we, I think we recognize that in order to better help our community, we've got to just, rather than hire more doctors or hire more nurses, it's about upskilling the general public so we feel comfortable supporting our neighbor or so we feel a bit comfortable talking to people about suicide, asking people about depression, asking people about addiction problems. Um, so that's part of the work that we've been doing. That's really encouraging, but I'll just share that with you guys. And we do want to continue to do that work. We do want to continue to support these people who've done the course, uh, you know, so they have a place um, that they can bring their difficult cases to and they feel well supported. So we're trying to make sure that they're trained professionals to supervise these, these coaches. That's part of the work that we continue to do. Um, I suppose, you know, part of the challenge for us is that in Christchurch, not like Auckland, Asians are a small group. We're only about 10%, I think, of the population in Christchurch. So we often get lost in the shuffle. Um, so I suppose I just want to kind of raise a voice. And um, I know that there's not many people doing what we're doing down there. So it's a little bit lonely. Uh, it's really nice for us to be up here among like-minded people so we feel a bit less lonely. Um, I think just from the connections I've made today, I feel really encouraged and I, feel, I think we can um, invite a few of you down there to help upskill our people down in Christchurch. Again, I'm a big fan of upskilling people rather than people kind of providing service directly. Because I, I just think it's way more efficient, you know, if we're training people up. And, and, and just on that subject, I, I'm a big, big advocate for cultural competency. Um, again, it's the idea of upskilling people. I think we started, we started over the last few months with um, education sectors. A few schools have reached out to us and we've done cultural competency workshops with them. Just kind of showing their teachers how to engage with Asian families, how to help them kind of know what you're talking about. An example is Asian families get freaked out if their principals call for a meeting. Because <laughs> in Chinese culture, it means your son's in trouble, right? But here it's not a big deal. And principals are like, why aren't Asian families turning up? Well, like, well because they're freaked out. Um, so it's simple things like that. It's just a couple, a couple of sentences can really make a big difference. Um, so yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And um, yeah, I'd love to kind of invite further conversation. If you guys have a heart for Christchurch and for our small Asian community in Christchurch, oh, feel free to reach out to us. You know, talk to Ellen, talk to me. Um, we'd love to have you down there and just uh, see where we can move things forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, like exactly. Yeah. So um, I'll happen. make it really short and really ask a question. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I run a startup um, uh, AI company. So um, we work with around 47, uh, 47 uh, psychologists and doctors building up um, scientifically approved database and trying to uh, provide a scalable and um, um, affordable and accessible mental health service. So, um, and also we build a portal for a lot of psychologists or counselors to try their therapies on our platform to really get an understanding of how AI reacts to uh, mental health um, 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 patients. So um, I'm just keen to um, understand the view from the minister and also from the panel around uh, how, um, you know, AI, uh, the uses of AI uh, in the mental health sector. So that was my question. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I think the answer is I, I, don't, I don't know about AI. I okay. do know that the, uh, the use of telehealth services and electronic media um, are increasing, and, and I guess the, um, the AI would be a kind of component of that. But whilst on uh, telehealth, you know, people have talked about the smaller communities represented, and Mags, you uh, mentioned before, you know, what does Asian mean? People have said pretty strongly today, um, you know, I will need to be able to see someone that I can relate to. Mm -hmm. if, you're in a, if you're in Rangiora or you're in Taranaki, it may be that the cultural service is the same cultural service as the people who are seeking it. So I guess I see that um, telehealth services, electronic access is actually quite helpful in that situation. So the same, please keep your minds open. It's a bit like um, swimming with your togs on. It's not quite as good, but it's still good. So, <laughs> so get out there and learn about telehealth. And I believe that it's going to be a really big chunk of it. Someone else said before, we can't treat our way out of this. And I think that's right. If, if families and, um, and whanau and communities become uh, more resilient and more skilled, you said it there, in supporting people, we're going to be a much better place. The state isn't the best at doing this, but no, uh, so. Are optimal in the north one? <laughs> <laughs> Band, I think. I'm going to talk about some of jobs. Um, I just wanted to look, I think we need to be looking at all options. I have, I purposely got on my um, phone so I can know that I'm talking about it, is that we do promote an assessment framework for safe e mental health tools. So. Uh, if you haven't seen that, then that would be what we'd be saying that's that position. Because I feel like even I don't know enough about AI tools and clinical safety, but I would recommend that you look at it. It's called the uh, uh, DMHAT, the Digital Mental Health. Tool. Yeah. <laughs> so I would look at it. It's on. Uh, it's developed by the ministry and is, is held on the. Um, to put on website, happy to give you the link for that, and that would be our starting point always is uh, for us anything that we can do is making sure that it's safe um, and fit for purpose would be the position I would take. But anything we can be to be innovative, we need to start looking at. So, kia ora. Thank you. Um, I do have one question that came through this one first, or listen to Cam. Hello, everybody. See me running around. Um, and also I'm the National Public Health Lead at Asian Family Services. So um, I have 10 um, team members uh, from six different ethnicities. Um, and we have three offices in Wellington, Auckland, and Christchurch. So my question to our lovely panelists. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't see any national um, mental health campaign, including our Asians, uh, which was so disappointed. Um, so when we um, discuss the challenges, we always talk about the language barrier, the cultural barrier, and how we and we are the people who work with the community every day. We know the challenges and we know how to tackle the challenges. But the challenges for us is we don't have the funding. We, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the resources to help the community to enhance their knowledge about how important our you know, mental health is. So my question to our panelists is, I hope probably in the future, any you know, national public campaign about the mental health, can our Asian people be included? Thank you. It's a good point, and I think uh, sometimes we miss out on, uh, on recognizing priority groups or, or the contract that out in a way that that happens. But I would point out that uh, one of the minister's priorities and targets is about investment in prevention, promotion, and early intervention. Mm -hmm. Now that's a target that will have to be met. We have to, we have to do that. So I guess I think that's a very good sign for your question. Thank you. I'd just like to go back to um, making a comment about the previous question around the AI. Um, and really just my comment is that, um, I mean, there's a lot of development internationally that I think we should be connected up with, as well as those standards that were referenced. But I also think that seeing any digital electronic tools as part of an integrated ecosystem, so not something that's alone. So what's the person um, and their whanau's journey through the system? 
and how do we get the sort of warm handoffs and, and a connected system. So um, what concerns me is if we see um, just standalone solutions, because um, then what happens with people at the next stage? So it's how do we get that integrated for NW? I think it's really important. I have seen some reports there are clinicians who are trialling AI for note taking, mm -hmm. um, and from what I've read, some of the feedback is really positive in that the clinicians spend more time looking at uh, Tanga or their, their other clients, um, less focused on future, more on people. Thank you. Um, now, so we are, I am very conscious of time and I do want to make sure that we can hear from the Minister for as long as we can for his insights. So I would just like to ask all of our audience to put your hands together for our panellists who's very brave enough to